to the Cross Line Podcast. My name is Carlos and today I have two very special guests with me here in Asheville, North Carolina. I have the founder of Grind Coffee in Black Wall Street, Asheville, Mr. Jay Hackett, and also Miss Aisha Adams, co-developer of and director of Black Wall Street, Asheville, and the Gate Program. How are you guys doing? Doing good, doing good. Having a great day. Thank you. It's Friday. Absolutely. It's always good. It's Friday. <laughs> Thank you guys. I know we had to kind of re- do some rescheduling. Uh-huh. We're over the last we are here with you guys, so thank you for having me. I actually spent some time. I already bought some, some merch already. I see. The Black Wall Street, so I, I love that. It's, it's funny, I actually was uh, going back reading over the book, The History of the Black Dog, um, by um, Angel, Angel, Angel Rich, Angel Rich, and um, just going over Black Wall Street. Just, once I saw those wristbands, I was like, you know what? I had to. Gotta stuff. have it. Gotta have it. Because I love the whole concept behind it, and we'll, we'll dive more into that as well. Um, but like I said, I know we had to reschedule some things that transpired while you guys while we had to reschedule. You guys had the incubator program. Am I correct? Correct. How can you talk about what, you know, like, what was the overall impact of the incubator program? Well, of course, to incubate means to help grow. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the incubator program was a way for us to uh, help black owned businesses around the country learn how they can benefit by participating in tourism economy. Mm -hmm. Cities all over the country are receiving dollars from their hotel tax in order to attract more people to the city. Um, But oftentimes, black and brown owned businesses are not participating. And so they don't get any of those contracts. Marketing dollars are not spent with them. Visitors are not directed to... Uh, patronize their establishments and so we decided rather than uh, just talk about it we would actually do something about it so we brought businesses together um, and told them how they can plug into their local tourism economy what were some of the things that the entrepreneurs had the opportunity to, to learn about from that program well the first thing they had to learn was that there is a, a, a tourism office in our community it's called the Tourism Development Authority. And most communities have a similar name, uh, but that's the first thing. Aisha, what were some of the other things that, that people need to know? Yeah, we, um, we were working with uh, black business owners to really help them position their products to be able to be sold to tourists, mm-hmm. right? And we wanted to show them how they could plug into the dollars, the marketing opportunities, as well as the grants that are available from the Tourism Development Authority in their area. Why do you think I guess overall, in your community and overall, like a lot of black owned businesses are not aware of these type of programs and the access to this type of content. Well, you know, um, you don't know what you don't know, and that's that's a normal thing. There's um, there's uneducation, which means that you just lack the information, and then there's miseducation. Uh, Carter G. Woodson wrote The Miseducation of the Negro, and what he talked about was that there's a force that is giving bad information, and historically, and systemic racism. Uh, it, it feeds bad information, it feeds negative information uh, to black communities, and it trains people to not know and to not ask. And so one of the reasons that people don't know is because the information was kept away from them. Uh, but historically, you also find that, uh, that when one of us win, we all win. And so when one person goes and finds the information, they bring it back to the community and they share it. And so that's what we've done. The things that we've discovered um, have happened here that are wonderful and positive that are happening in Asheville and Buncombe County. Uh, We're like, well, could this happen in Erie, Pennsylvania? And it can. Could this happen in Salisbury, North Carolina? It can. Could this happen in larger cities, in smaller cities? We find that this is a pattern. There's information and opportunities available that people don't know about because they never asked and because nobody ever told them. Do you feel like part of that stems also from like the school system? Because for the most, a lot of times, when it comes to the education system, it's about you know, going to school, get make good grades, and um, go to college, get a job. And that's it. Be be, be employed, yeah. not necessarily talk, teaching you about you know, running your own. Even yeah. back when, see, I graduated in high school in 2010, we graduated from college in 2014, but they never really taught us about finance. No, they're not going to. They're not going to. Now, yeah. uh, Aisha uh, used to be a school teacher, so I don't know if we have similar ideas about education, the American education system. I don't know who should go first, me or you. <laughs> You can go first. I'll, Listen, I'll. The American education system was never designed to create leaders. It was designed to create workers in factories. Uh, it's impossible for you to develop any type of expertise, learning one thing for 40 minutes, and then ring a bell, and then move. Uh, 
that that's that's just wasn't that that's not how you design expertise. That's not how you build experts. The American education system was designed to prepare a workforce. And then high school was designed to create supervisors in that workforce. And and, and the workforce was there to serve companies that were owned by white males. And so it was never designed to 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 encourage creative thinking. It wasn't ever designed to, to help a person understand how money works or financial independence. And so when we look at college, which happens to be an extension of, of, of all of the above, it just sends people into further debt. Um, and, and like college is the one place when you spend money for it and they promise you nothing except a piece of paper. So, uh, so the American education system, uh, albeit important to dealing with some of these structures that are here, Mm-hmm. I don't think that it is, um, I don't think it's the key because it was never designed to help people establish financial inter- independence. It was designed to help them be part of somebody else's system. Yeah, I think we have uh, similar viewpoints on education. One of the things that I'll point out, though, that anything that the government gives you for free is a handout, and it is going to be at the lowest level, right? So to me, public school is the Medicaid of our education system. (laughs) So um, I think it's really important to understand that uh, free public education is a handout. It is not meant to design leaders. It is was it has largely not changed since the Industrial Revolution. It is still like education is the one system that has not changed. Everything is still the same. Sometimes even your teachers, you, you graduated in 2014. How many of your teachers are still at the school teaching the same thing they was teaching in 2010? So it really is just to be um, honest with you, an opportunity for us when it comes to education. I actually divested from the education system, homeschool my son, and he's a senior in college now. Um, I think it's really important for us just to understand the role that education plays. That is for the have-nots. Was that what kind of steered you away from once you got into that into the um, the public school system? Was that what kind of once you saw what was going on with the teaching of young children? Was that kind of what steered you away from? It? Yeah, I mean, I would have nightmares because I was like really a part of this systemic process that was hurting black boys and girls and hurting myself, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we don't take care of our teachers, we don't take care of our students, and we don't take care of our administrators. It is the one thing, it's like you go, right? And they worry about everybody's mental health but the teacher. But if the teacher's mental health is bad, if the teacher doesn't have any money, how can she groom leaders, right? And so that was why I left, when I realized that my students had better cars and bank accounts than I did. I, for me, I didn't really understand it until after college because, you know, growing up, you know, I always talk about it. And my parents always tell me, you know, when you go to school, go to college, get your degree and get a good job so you don't have to work like we did. Of course, you know, get a job and make good money. So once I got my, once I got my degree and I got into the workforce, I was just already about forty, fifty thousand dollars in debt in school alone. So I was working two jobs just to try to pay the bills. And working 13, 14 hours a day, I'm like, I don't want to live like this. Something just, something about this just doesn't feel right. So I quit my job, and that's what kind of, you know, because I was doing um, some media, working in the media when I was in college, and I couldn't get a job in my field. So I ended up um, quitting one of my jobs and just start my own media business just to, because I was like, I went to school for this, let me, you know, mm-hmm. I agree. And um, I, actually, I actually wrote a book that came out three years ago, and controversial because the title of it is called F School Life is Your Best Teacher. <laughs> and on the front of it, my son, he's holding my college degree and I'm sitting right there looking at him. So when you look at it, he's like, why is he saying F School? But he has a college degree. But I make it clear in my book, I'm saying there's nothing wrong with going to school. Um, if you go to college, understand what you're going for. Because if not, you're just wasting time and money. Yeah, and for yeah, me, yeah. I was... 18 years old going straight into college and not knowing what I really wanted to do at the time. So I was just like, this just saved me four years of like having to go yeah. to the workforce. So I went there not really understanding it until like my senior year and then I ended up picking up an internship. But it's like a lot of times when you get out of college, then you can't get a job in the field because you like experience. Absolutely. So it's all of those things that's tied into it. And it's just like, man, the school and it doesn't always give you those life skills. It, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't because it wasn't designed to. It was designed to make you numb and to stop you from thinking. It was designed to cause you to respond to triggers. 
and not to think creatively. That's what school was designed for. And so you cannot ask a thing uh, to do an activity that's different from its original purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, that's abuse, abnormal use. So to expect school to teach entrepreneurship or to teach leadership is abusing what school really was. So no matter what programs they create, it's always gonna run into a systemic problem uh, mm -hmm. because school is designed to create followers, not leaders. But what you can do is always repurpose a thing. So I went to college and I went to college as a, I was a music major in the beginning. Um, I wanted to be an opera singer. Um, and then I changed to sociology. And, uh, and later on, I realized that school for me, because I've never used any of the classwork, um, but what I have used is the experience of school. And I think school is really about finishing things. You know, there's a course of action, you need to finish it. And also, um, I don't know how this will come across, but school also introduced me to potential employees because there are other people there that have really bought into the system mm -hmm. and they yep. want a good job and I'll hire them. Yep, he does. And you know, I just made me think about something with um, Robert Kiyosaki. I read Rich Dad before that. And he was saying the school system almost like trains everybody to, to think the same way. So a lot of times when you talk to people that say they want to go get a good job, get the benefits, and you're making good money, you just stay there. And it also teaches you, like, you know, school teaches you like it's making mistakes are bad. Like in life, you're going to make mistakes, you can't even make mistakes and learn from them, but in school, you teach you, like, no, you don't want to make any mistakes, and then everybody's thinking the same way about how to solve. solve Absolutely. Solve, like, solve. And then here's the kicker, right? Just some nuggets for you. You go to school for like 14 years and everything you do is dependent on a grade, but then you go in corporate America and they want you to self-assess. <laughs> Right, you get into corporate America and you're like, okay, lady, where's my grade? And she's like, how well do you think you did? And you're like, uh, how well did I do? Right, so that's a nugget for you. Another really important nugget is I think the reason why school is important is the social aspect. I married somebody who's homeschooled. The things that he does not understand socially baffles me, right? Um, so there is some practical uses for school, but I think education doesn't stop with school. It is a baseline education and it's up to our community our nonprofit leaders, our parents, our community leaders to say, hey, there's more to this than what you're learning. Let's build on that. And I always like to make sure I tell people there's nothing wrong with going to school and getting your education because if you can afford to go, it's a great thing. And scholarships, grants, anything you can to help pay for school. But just don't bank on that. Like one of my professors told me, like, once you graduate from college, this is just the beginning. The learning process doesn't stop. You're always going to have to learn something. So yeah. don't think that once you get your diploma or your degree, that you're done learning. It's like a whole nother level of things. And we we had a family disconnect, right? Because our parents went to college and got good jobs. Like, we know architects. <laughs> we know people that used to work at NASA. Like, it didn't work like that for us. But about 50 years ago, if you went to college, you got a good job. And college equaled a job. And then it stopped. So, I'm like, I remember sitting at the big round table, and I'm like, no, this is my check, and I'm a teacher. They're like, a teacher? I'm like, yes. They're like, are you a teacher's assistant? I'm like, no, sir. I'm a real teacher. Here's my degree. Degree, here's my certification, and I don't make forty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So let, let, let's go back for a quick second because I want people to know more about you guys. But well, we definitely want to talk more about everything that you guys have. Can you can you tell us um, where you guys both of you originally from? I'm from Philadelphia, okay. North Philly, actually. Okay. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, heart yeah. of the civil rights movement. I was just in Birmingham about two, three weeks ago. I was doing some work with the. Um, the New Orleans Pelicans G League team, the Birmingham Squadron, they're based in, so I was down in Birmingham. I've interviewed several entrepreneurs down that way. But, um, and, I, and I asked that because, like, so for you guys, you know, being where you come like, what, what did you see growing up? Did you come from the families of entrepreneurs, or were they just choosing or not? <laughs> My family was a family of entrepreneurs, but I can't talk about them. <laughs> 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 they all work for themselves. <laughs> okay, that's the, um, um But I grew up, and there, there, there's actually um, the, my grandmother. I grew up, um, my mom was a teen mom, and so my grandmother actually took care, and this is my father's mom, uh, took care of both my mom and me. So my mom calls her mommy, even though not, they're not blood related, and I call her grandmother, um, and I'm treated like her 11th child. So uh, I had a very, very close-knit family, um, and it's a family of hustlers. 
and I think grandmother was uh, the lead hustler. And this, this is what happened. We were, uh, we were at the house, um, and somebody needed some money. And, uh, and grandmother would say, turn around. And, uh, and she would go into her bra and pull out a sock that had money in it. And I didn't know where she got her money from. Um, but no matter what happened, no matter who needed something, she always had money. Uh, and later on, I started to realize uh, that she had insurance policies on everybody, uh, that she knew how to save her money. She was careful about what she spent. Um, uh, and, and so when, when I look at the family, the family structure, what we, what we had was a family of survivors. Now, there was lots of public assistance. There was lots of, you know, the paper food stamps and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when it came down to it, we didn't waste money. Uh, nobody uh, was waiting on somebody else to do something for them. Um, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a family of support and joy, but it, it, the bottom line was that, like, nobody's going to give you anything. You're going to have to take care of what you have. If you want something, you're going to have to go after it. So my mom is one of 12 and my dad is one of 11. And I always tell people that I grew up on the side of Birmingham where when Birmingham was built, there were three things that made people made them settle there. And it's like the three things to make iron grew naturally within a 10 mile radius. And I grew up on the side where they made the steel where the pollution is, right? And they used the mountains to separate us. So we would go over the mountain to have a good time. We'd go over the mountain to see the big houses. We'd go over the mountain to see what success looks like. Even today, there is a $75,000 gap between the medium income on the side of the tracks where the pollution comes and the side of the track where the pollution doesn't come. And I saw that as a child. I, I come from a family of civil rights leaders, military people, like my, I feel like my family was just right above like, okay, we're not gonna be on food stamps, we're gonna go into the milita military and serve. We're not gonna do this, we're gonna go and work that city job and serve. And I just knew that I didn't wanna be that woman that you see in the same position for 25 years. If I go to the library, public library right now, the same woman who was head of the public library when I couldn't afford a computer and I was sneaking in to like do my papers is the same woman that's there now. And I just knew that couldn't be my future. What were some of the, the, the things, uh, like family values, that you each of you do for yourself, like not relying on anybody to take care of you? What are some other things that you know, some of those family values? Because do for self is one of the most critical things that I think our community definitely needs to understand by you. Being able to take care of yourself and your you people. Um, what are some other uh, family values that you um, My family really value hard work. Um, even today, one of the, like, I don't, I, uh, like, I don't take naps. Like, I don't like to sleep. Now, to the extreme, it's not very healthy. Uh, but the idea behind it is that I grew up uh, with grandmother saying, like, why are you, what, what's going on? Find something to do. So that, that's part of, that's just part of uh, my, my culture and my upbringing. The other thing is my family really values honesty. Um, grandmother's past. And so, uh, so there are a lot of hard lessons uh, that she taught me just by sitting there. Um, she was always very, very honest and direct. And the things that she said were not politically correct. They, they, were, they were very harsh. Um, I had a cousin that called her and said, um, you know, grandmother, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. And grandmother said, what? You ain't you ain't gonna kill yourself. You got all them kids over there. Who gonna take care? Of, who gonna take care of your baby? You got a whole bunch to live for. Grandmother told her to have a drink and call her after the stories went off. Mm. Now, that's not politically correct. Like I'm like, what? How in the world can you say that to somebody? You get what I'm saying? Mm. But later on, uh, now I changed majors to sociology and I became a, spe a specialist in explosive disorders. Later on, I realized that that was actually safety contracting. Grandmother was actually reminding her of what she had to live for, was separating her from the despair, and also giving a promise that she'll check back in with her after the after the um, after the stories went off, after Young and Restless went off. You gotta call me back. You get what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. So there's wisdom in grandmother's chair. So there, these are these are some of the things. And as people, um, and I work with people closely, I tend to be a a, a, a pretty honest person, uh, sometimes offensively honest, uh, but people know that I care. I think it's so unique, not to cut you off, but so unique how our elders had a unique way of, of teaching back then. Even my parents, 
my dad, he grew up on the farm, and his grandfather, you know, he, he said, he said, Grandpa, when he told you something, he only told you one time, and that was it. So if, if he let you do, tell you to do something, then he ain't gonna do it. But it was just out of tough love, and, and that, my, 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 my dad, he instilled that in us, like it's hard work, discipline, do what you do what you told um, to do. And, you know, just him working on the pharmacy. You know, Grandpa, I see y'all in there, go get everything done, come back, make sure it's done how it's supposed to be done. But it's just though, the way he looked at him, he's like, man, Grandpa was just so hard on him, but it instilled a lot in him to this day. And you know, my, my, my dad, he was, um, he said, y'all just don't understand how good y'all got it now. Because back then, Grandpa, oh man, he said, Grandpa did not play at all, but it was just a lot of things that our elders, you know, instilled in us. They, they don't let you get away with today as far as like, mm-hmm. you just whipping the children and stuff like that. My, my, my dad told us that your, your neighbors could whip you back then and then they'll see you back home and then you get another one. After, after that. But it's, some of the ways that they took were um, this from back then, um, can't do it today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I grew up, I'm Southern, so you know what? I grew up in the church. Like at the end of the day, we can talk all this new school stuff, but at the end of the day, the be altitudes is what I learned, right? I had my Easter speech and I was up there, okay? Um, and we also learned the Ingles of Saba, so self-determination, cooperative economics, right? Mm-hmm. So those were the things that I was raised on, and I grew up in community. And I was one of them little girls who got about three whoopings and then got home and got a whooping. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. When, when, I, when I think about what it was to grow up in the city, especially North Philly, in the middle of the crack epidemic, there are people that look at uh, inner city and they make judgment calls um, when they didn't grow up there. So they assume Mm -hmm. that because of the violence that it was only violent or because of the drugs, it was only drugs. And while there are parents um, of children in the 80s and those parents were strung out, uh, we looked out for each other. Like your neighbor, you could really reach out of your window and into your neighbor's window. Um, I mean, people could share electricity. That's how close (laughs) the the house, I mean, it's row houses. You get what I'm saying? and so there was there was deep community and the drug dealers again i don't condone any type of illegal behavior but the drug dealers of the 80s were different than what i see today those 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 young men they would drive like the mustang 5.0 i think that was the fancy car of the day um if they knew that somebody's mom did not have they would actually buy things for the kids buy things for the family if there was an older lady that was living alone they would they would go by and check on her and take care take care of house like these are the types of things that happen and I remember um, I was talking to one of the known drug dealers and, and he could tell that I was interested in what he was doing. And he said, nah, little man. He said, stay in school, stay in the books. This, this ain't your world. You got what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it encouraged me, uh, that, that type of respect, that type of guidance. Uh, he's, he recognized that what he was doing wasn't the best thing, but he wanted something better for me, even though we were not blood related. I, I, I've heard a lot of stories like that, especially like that. Former athletes, they would say things like, you know, growing up, you know, the drug dealers would see that they had a lot of potential. And if they would try to go over there where they are, they'd be like, nah, you're going to stay away from this lifestyle. You got a, a bright future ahead of you. So they would say, back to those neighborhoods a long time ago, that they would help keep them, you know, stay on. Absolutely, absolutely. And and it was, uh, when you look at, when, when you look today, in hindsight is 2020, you look at what, what the drug economy is and does. Um, and actually, well, you didn't tell me about the book, but we talked about it, Freakonomics. Um, it, part of the research of, of the drug economy is that there are transferable skills. And so those, those men and women are actually entrepreneurs and, and, and don't even know it, really. Uh, they don't know that they have specialties in human resource management, um, human resources and risk management and financial management and planning and interviewing skills. Um, they, 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 have, they have skills. Um, in, in sales and in marketing. They understand how to meet market demand and how to interpret market demand. Uh, like there are so many things that they already know about that are not necessarily honored and not necessarily highlighted. Um, so when we find young men in the 21st century that are interested in that, I think it's important both for the educational system and for social systems to take these, what are otherwise uh, skills used in a bad way and use them, those same skills for a good way. Absolutely. It's a book. Um, it made me think about a book by, by Rich Paul, LeBron James. He had a book called Lucky Me that came out, I think, back in October. And his father 
they were from Cleveland, Ohio, and his father had a, a, a grocery store that everybody in the neighborhood would come to, and they they all knew Rich Paul, and, he, and his dad just taught him life skills. Um, he told him, like, if your money ever get low, he pulled out a set of dice and showed him how to shoot dice. Um, then he, Rich Paul got there, he started, you know, playing basketball and selling girls and stuff like that, but he never did it. He never looked at it as a way of, like, intentionally hurting anybody. It was just a way to, you know, provide for himself and provide for his family, you know, he would get money to his friends and everything. But he just talked about, you know, the, he also spoke about the crack epidemic and how he felt like it was intentionally done to, you know, to, to tear down the black community because mm -hmm. they was clearly thriving at one point in time and then, uh, you know, the war of drugs mm -hmm. and the guns and everything. He, he spoke about how all of this stuff was intentionally done to, you know, tear down. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it was successful. It was successful. It was it was a type of ethnic cleansing, um, and it gave gave rise to further like to the next wave of gentrification, and we are right now in in a, in a neighborhood that was gentrified. This neighborhood right here, this block, right ac this building was dilapidated, um, and and right across the street was what they what they used to call a hole in the wall club, and and today the people who live here can barely afford. Um, I mean, the people who work here can barely, barely afford to live here. It, just down the street is, is the public housing, the housing authority properties. And the whole block uh, used to be fill, filled with people who lived in poverty. But the people who live up the street cannot afford anything at the bottom of the street. It made me, I, we went to, we went to uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Probably, this was about four years ago when we did our first self investment tour. And it was crazy to see how, in one side of town, you know, the neighborhood, or just rough neighbors, things are torn down. But then if you go maybe one or two streets over, it's like a totally. It's totally different. Totally and it's different. by design. Yeah. Cities make their plans 50 years ahead of time. Mm -hmm. 50 years ahead of time. They've, they've created the plan. This neighborhood right now is. is is, is an example of the plan working. The Wilma Dykeman plan, that is, uh, it is what created the, the, the vision for the River Arts District, was already written back in the 60s and 70s. So no matter what the crack epidemic did, no matter what crime did, it was all factored into the plan. And so at some point, and, and this is how systemic racism works in communities, at some point we have to lower the property value and allow crime uh, so that people get displeased and so that investors can come in and buy it for pennies on the dollar and then we'll jack the ta we'll jack the taxes up so the rest of the people who live there can't afford to stay and then the prices come up so that now only newer people that can afford to be there are there and now the local people that you can honestly say well you can live wherever you can afford to live but what caused me not to be able to afford to live here? And you see that plan start to grow. Oh, even what, even where I'm from now, the small town where I'm from, you see you know, these plants bringing different jobs down to our area. And you see more corporate companies like uh, Starbucks and Walmart yep. moving in and building houses and everything on all the different areas we have out there. And meanwhile, the prices on everything just stop. It's going up. The price is going up, but the wages are not. And what's interesting about that, y'all, is how the environment is used to create that. So you, it, when, while you're here, as you drive around, we I think we have seven housing authorities. I think we they say we have <laughs> more housing authorities per capita than New York and Asheville, but you won't see them mm -hmm. because of the way that they use hills and valleys and peaks to hide them. To hide them. Mm -hmm. um, they are tucked away behind, like, think about One how, way in, one way out. Yeah. Fully gated. And you won't see it. And um, I went to visit a client, and I was like, oh, I love this apartment. And she was like, girl, this is the housing authority. And I was like, for real? So it's like this, all these trick, like all these freakonomics tricks mm -hmm. to help us not be able to Matter see fact, the picture. I think that, that's a good word, trickonomics. Trickonomics. <laughs> to like help us, like to, to confuse us on what is real. And we have to think about like most of America doesn't look like Atlanta, doesn't look like Charlotte. It looks like the towns that we're from. What would be like the, the best way? I have so many questions. I, I love the way the conversation is going. Like, what, what would you say is like one of the best ways, I guess, in a sense, to combat like what you see going on? Is it entrepreneurship. More of entrepreneurship, or Black Wall Street, or those type of things, or 
It is working. absolutely entrepreneurship. Uh, Aisha and I used to work together in a workforce development program. And in that program, we were uh, initially working to get people hired. And then people get hired, it didn't change their life. Then um, they said, well, they need to be hired at a living wage. Um, and then they were hired at a living wage at the time, I think it was $13, or maybe it might have been twelve fifty. Somebody got hired at $13 an hour and they had to quit because they could not afford to work. This is what happened. That $13 an hour just being on paper for them before they went to work and got their first check caused them to be disqualified from their living, um, their, their public subsidy living. And so their rent went up before they even got their first check. So now you have rent that you have to pay um, and then you have child care because you're going to work. And so the young lady could not go to work. So then Aisha was the first one that said to me, Jay, people don't need a living wage. People need a thriving wage. So now I think we, or she calculated a thriving wage is something like $17, $18 an hour, but you can't own a house. And and if you have any type of leftover le leftover debt from, from the world you used to live in, you're still paying crazy interest rates. You're still uh, subject to predatory lending. And so no matter what we did, we kept being a day late and a dollar short. No matter what job you work, you're still pushing somebody else's something. And so at some point, um, uh, black people uh, have to decide that they're going to put their own creativity to work. It does not mean that you must leave your nine to five because sometimes that's the best way to have a benefits in the healthcare plan. But you gotta be smart. Just like the people that escaped slavery had to be intelligent. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. If you're gonna escape poverty, you gotta be just as wise. I was baffled by the live, living wage movement um, because even the slave master made sure the slaves could come to work next day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You out here making a living wage and you get a flat tire or COVID, you can't make it to work. They not even paying enough for you to make it the next day. At least the slave master said, here go your rations, here go your clothes, you can come the next day. So we really got to divest away from all this like fancy uh, vocabulary and get into the weeds. And I think the most powerful thing is knowledge because when you know better, you can do better, right? So if you don't understand like what we're going through, it's harder to counteract it. I think that's why we have so many people that leave their jobs because they don't understand the value of a good job, right? I'm gonna get my insurance, I'm gonna get my retirement. You know, most black people, like they'll ask like, how much money do you make? But when I was dating, I wanna know, have you worked enough to draw Social Security? Are you, do, do you have the green check mark mm -hmm. under your Social Security number so that at 62, you can get a check for the rest of your life? Yeah. yeah. The, I remember my barber, we had a conversation one time, and, and he was talking about how, you know, like, the system of um, how it kind of, like, enslaved our people as far as, like, you know, like, the section from Section 8, and food section, all this stuff, like, you can't, you can only make a certain amount from your job, or not. and then uh, even with the uh, like Section 8 part, he was talking about how they pulled the black man away from the family because like, the mother can't have them. Absolutely. And all, and so all the stuff was systemically built in. And it, and it yeah. Was, it, it, it was built in that way. There, there's a book called Regulating the Poor. I love the book. My, my political science teacher uh, told me about it. Um, her, her doctoral research was the myth of the welfare queen and she studied it for the city of Baltimore. Um, and so when she told me about this book, I was like, yeah. Uh, but I read it, and the book is amazing. It's called Regulating the Poor. And the book explains how the American welfare system was never meant to bring people out of welfare and to establish independence. It was only built as a social and political tool to give politicians something to create causes to run for and to make business and to generate revenue for uh, rich people. So who's building the housing authorities? Who is providing the services uh, that Section 8 is paying for? Who, who's, who's, who's actually benefiting from these things? It's, it's not the poor people. It's not the poor people. It is it is the already rich people. And my uncle told me something. He said, that system is designed to just give you just enough. So if I can give you uh, a place to stay for cheap and give you some food stamps or something. If I can give you that, that doesn't give you an incentive to want more. You're like, Absolutely. You know, fucking all this stuff. Like, what, what, what entitlement do I have to go to work? Exactly. It, it robs you of your passion. It is it is the Willie Lynch letter in, in action. 
It is it is lulling. Uh, it's making you sleep. It's making you a walking zombie. It also is enculturating you. It's it's causing you to be around the people that are might that might not be motivated. You get what I'm saying? And then your children are growing up with these with these images all around them. Um, and then we wonder why what what's happening uh, in our youth happens is because they're not exposed. Because exposure creates appetite. The appetite creates passion. And, and so if, if you're not exposed to anything better, um, then you're not ever going to be hungry for it. You're not ever going to be, you're not ever going to go after anything better. It is a system that is designed uh, to cause people to fail. Um, and then for the powers that be to put it, to stand back and say, well, we made, we have the opportunity. We have the such and such. They just didn't want it. Well, what did you do to stop them from winning? Y'all want to hear an interesting, like, landlord story? Uh -huh. So I was training these landlords, right? And so um, I asked, like, you know, what makes you choose a tenant? Because they were, like, choosing their, they get to choose their tenant. In this market, if you have a space, you can pick your price, pick your tenant. Um, and the lady said, I want somebody excited about my space. So I said... Ma'am, so you're telling me that I was paying $50 in rent, now I'm finna pay you $300, and you want me to be excited and not scared? Because, you know what I'm saying? You want me to be excited. When I was living in the housing authority, if my stove broke, I dialed a number, they come bring a new stove. If I break your stove, I'm paying you $300, and you're going to give me a headache about your stove. Right? So we have to really think about how are we positioning ourselves to be owners of our own thing and not under the, the rule of somebody else's. Because imagine not smiling being the reason you don't have housing. Well, we'll speak about you know, entrepreneurship being the key to some of well, I, I, I grew up, of course, in North Philly, and I was poor, but I didn't know it. Um, I had, I mean, I had everything that I wanted. I was a house full of love, lots of people. We had 22 people that lived in our house, three bedroom, one bath, um, and, and we made it work. A lot of people. Um, but we, me and my mom moved to a new neighborhood, and my mom had a car. <clears throat> there was no grocery store. There was only the corner store. Now, at the corner store, you could buy a Little Debbie snack for 25 cents. But at the grocery store, they had a box of 10 for a dollar. And so I was like, well, I'm going to take my money. I'm going to take my dollar because I used to sweep, I used to sweep the, um, the steps and take out the trash for the corner store once a week. And they would pay me $2. And so I took those, I uh, spent $1, and I took another dollar and bought a box of Little Debbie sn snack cakes. And I sold them for 20 cents. And I realized that I could make more money doing that than I did sweeping. Uh, and so what I would do, my sweeping now was just to meet the customers. So I could get them to now buy from me instead of from the corner store. Um, and I started to do that and I started to make money. And later on I started to do other business and everything. And I knew that I did not want to be poor. Um, but I developed the skill of being able to go to one part of town and understand information and translate that information to my people. And so I started to do that and I became... Uh, kind of a, a, a person that would transfer information to the point that that's where I am now. I sell information um, and I make sure that my people know the stuff that's available to them. Yeah, I don't remember not having a business. Like, I remember like having books and I could get like new kids on the block books and new kids on the block was like the stuff. And you could check out my book for a dollar. Like you could check it out as long as you like signed my little contract and turned it back in. When I was in middle school, I wrote the rap lyrics for the boys. And I chuck, because you know, the boys like the rap art. So mm -hmm. I would record the songs and write them down and sell song lyrics. Um, I've always been an entrepreneur, but I entered into a program in high school called the Yes Program, where we learned to write business plans and we got to compete for real money. And um, that was really big for me and it really changed my trajectory because then I knew I could get like grants from the government. So I got my first $500 grant when I was like 16. Yeah. Mr. Hackett, you said that you were um, the first ever black on coffee shop. You were talking about you were the first mm -hmm. one black, black owned coffee shop in Asheville. How does that feel? And is it like a, I guess, like a sense of like, it's a, of course you want to wear it as a, a badge of honor, but at the same time, you know, like a sense of feeling like, man, this is 2024. Only the first one to have a black-owned business in a coffee shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for clarity, 
uh, this is the first black owned coffee shop documented. But in this neighborhood, um, there were 38 businesses. Um, now, none of them were known as coffee shops, but I'm sure that somewhere in the black community, there was a place that served coffee. Uh, the sad part about it is that what the Jim Crow South did, um, it caused uh, black businesses to not be recognized. And so if nobody else tells our story, then our kids won't know about it. Um, it, is, it is a slap in the face of history that, uh, that no coffee shop <coughs> had been documented. Notwithstanding, uh, this is the first black owned coffee shop uh, that's documented here in Asheville. Um, and it, it's, it is a badge of honor, but it also is big responsibility. Um, and so this place cannot just be a coffee shop. It has to be a place uh, for people to meet and gather. It has to be a community space, and that's why it's set up the way that it is. Does it ever feel like, you know, pressure, somewhat pressure, or like these expectations that they set on black-owned businesses <laughs> yeah. you have to be up to par or like exceed expectations because it's not, you know, a lot you, of you times got our community will, will unfortunately go out and bad mouth a, a black-owned establishment very quickly. Mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, some kind of pressure, like, you have to exceed those expectations. It is, it is. There, there's a lot of pressure, and the pressure is coming from, from all communities. Um, a, a white supremacist culture uh, doesn't put direct pressure on you. They put systemic pressure on you. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, the, the pastors by or the, the community members, uh, the pressure is all about expectation. Um, and so we try to manage expectations. Uh, we realize that we can't meet all of them, but we are very excited about where we are. And so um, it was uh, Steve Jobs, somebody asked him, uh, what do people want? And he said, well, they, don't, they won't know until I show them. And I think that part of, the, part of the responsibility of entrepreneurs is to show people a different way to do business. And so there are other coffee shops here. We are not competing to be the best coffee shop. We're competing to be the best community spot. Uh, and so um, other coffee shops are our teachers and our partners. We collaborate on things. Um, they, they support everything that we're doing. Uh, but when it comes to grind when it comes to our coffee shop our motto is that it's more than just coffee it's, you, okay. I was gonna say, do you feel like it's that pressure as an entrepreneur um, to exceed those expectations of yeah, so I, I work in the belly of the beast. I work with white people. I work with white supremacy, against white supremacy, and I work in corporate settings. So before I got here, I was in a room with 150 engineers talking about diversifying and creating a more inclusive workforce, right? So um, I think over the years, I've kind of let myself, allowed myself the ability to, to understand that my trauma response is perfection. Right, because we all like deal with trauma, and from being a black business owner, it's like, how do I like show up better, show up more, do the best, do the right? And then I see my counterparts doing less, right? And so, I've really am trying to learn that balance at this point in my career, right? Like, it's okay, I should have had bronchitis an ear infection and not go to work, right? It's okay to, to take the day off to have your person reschedule a meeting, but I still suffer from that perfectionism. I still try to show up, you know, as often as I can. I want to be here at Grind because this is a great unifier in our community. I want to be on Black Wall Street, and then I want to be in those spaces where I'm creating policy practices and procedural change. And so sometimes it can be like, being pulled in a whole bunch of different directions but at the end of the day like i feel like i was built for it and i'm i'm very grateful for the opportunities that i've had i was going to ask you about that you know being in the space of the diversity equity and inclusion um, just talking about their work um what why is it of course i i feel like a lot of our people should know why so but why do you think um other other races do not feel like it's as important or even when the situation down in florida um, where they passed the uh Governor DeSantis passed the, the, the law saying that schools can uh, dismantle the, the DEI Department of Investment in the University of Florida. Like, what are your overall thoughts about it and why do you feel like they kind of like don't understand the importance of 
Yeah. Um, I think that a lot of it has been miseducated, right? So mm -hmm. diversity, equity, inclusion is for everybody. Um, they like to think that it's for black people, but I like to um, point to the great to Simone Biles, the gymnast of our times, and I say, you know, it's, it's interesting because Simone can do anything, right? She, if you tell her to jump eight times and do a double flip, she'll do it, right? And when she comes out of the air, they'll say, that's not gymnastics. And then they'll disqualify her or penalize her, right? So policy practice and procedure is letting Simone know how to win it from the jump. We only want three flips in a, in a twist, right? And so the reality is we've all suffered from white supremacy, like all of us. Even white people, right? Women, lack of pay, lack of promotion, lack of access to the boardroom, our elderly community, feeling outdated, not being recognized. I go into companies where young people are like, they're not seeing me as a subject matter expert. They're sunning me every five minutes. So diversity, equity, and inclusion is for everybody, right? And black people, once we get the rules, we're great at excelling. Excellence is our culture. Absolutely. What, what would be the, like, what's if, if more companies in more states um, are adopting what Florida is going, what's, what's, what would be the solution for the, uh, what, what would be next if more places start adopting what, what Florida is trying to do? You know, it's interesting because more places are already adopting, right? It's already become like it was like a we, we hit a high point and now it's like it's barely talked about. This is history repeating itself, right? Because 10 years ago, nobody was talking about it. But 20 years ago, it entered into our workforce and it was a hot topic. And so, again, it's almost like businesses are responding to the social climate around them and they pick and choose what's important by what's going on socially. When um, the, the thing that's happening is, is part of the system um, and it's part of the cycle, um, and it really is all about money. Um, as long as something is, as I should name, a hot topic, then it's an easy target. Um, and as long as DEI is a committee, then somebody can go against that committee. As long as it's a category, somebody can go against that category. But when it becomes financial, then you have a whole different conversation. Um, money in an economy is like blood in a body and so the real issue is that money has stopped moving in certain places and that's why they're saying ouch so what we have to think about is how can we um, again be, be, be smarter and more wise and more intelligent about it and so today the target on the back is DEI as it, as it uh, regards black people um, but if you are in the desert and you are selling water and nobody else is selling water, you're solving the problem and nobody cares about your color. Um, and so rather than only point at what the easy target is, what about going to the cause of it and creating something that people need and they don't care what color your skin is? That's really what the original Black Wall Street was. People had been freed from slavery and they were supplying to communities all around the country the exact things that communities needed. And they decided when they received the money from paid invoices that they would not go out and waste it. They would save it and reinvest in their own communities. And that's, um, you know, studying up on, on Black Wall Street, it wasn't like it was just one particular area. It was, it was a area, it was like a, a concept that a lot of oh, people yeah. adopted. Every, every city in America had its own version of it. I mean, Tulsa is, is easy to identify oh, because... Yeah. That, that, was, that was a large one, and it was the first American city that was ever bombed. Mm -hmm. yep. And it was bombed by the U.S. military, all because of a lie. Yep. They were trying uh, to say the German. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So it was all because of that lie. Um, but in, in, in Birmingham, Alabama, with, with the steel, they had their own version of Black Wall Street. In Asheville, North Carolina, they had their own version of Black Wall Street. In Richmond, Virginia, um, you know, because of all the insurance companies and black-owned banks, it was a home of black capitalism. Like this Durham and Raleigh um, for engineering, like, uh, and, and, and for computer, computer and technology, like it was happening everywhere. It was happening everywhere. And the reason it was happening is because people were buying from those who were experts. And the people that were experts did not have any shame in their game they would hang out their shingle and say, I know how to do this. And so here we are today. What are the black people doing in our neighborhoods? Are they just going along with the system that tells them that they can't? 
Or are they hanging out their shingle and saying, I have this level of expertise. I know how to do this and I'm willing to do it. Black business has never been a black thing. Black business is everybody's business. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it was back then, like we had everything that we needed. We had uh, uh, stores, our own doctors, our bakeries, anything that we needed, we provided for each other. And I remember we interviewed some gentlemen um, that, that based in Atlanta, uh, Mr. Ali, that, that have a true laundry detergent. And he fought in Vietnam War, and I never forget, he, he always told us back back then, he said, you know, in their communities, he said, what they would do, always do is they would always buy from each other. Anything that in the black community, if you need some food, clothing, anything like that, y'all would kept all the money in our community. Only if somebody in our community didn't have it, then you would go outside. Mm -hmm. the community. But then he said, you know, once immigration came about, we kind of like dispersed our, our dollars and our money to it. Everywhere else, yeah, and now it's, it's kind of he was saying it's kind of like we don't tend to you know, support each other as much yeah. as we you know, by design, it was always about money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do you think our people, you know, have such a hard time supporting each other? You know, I mean, not to say that we don't do it because I, I think we do a good job of it, but it could be better. But it's, it's almost to a certain extent, like we love to see you, you know thrive but once you get to a certain point then we don't want to see you doing better than us the other person we try to tell them like, why do you think that's something that's kind of like there's this concept i call the new plantation and um and even though we're not part of the the, the antebellum south right now um this new plantation is very active today there is a, a white man who's a master and they will select chosen black people that will be governors of the slaves. And the goal is to get them to work against each other, to insert mistrust, to, 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 to create conflict. Uh, why are our neighborhoods over-policed? Why, why, why is the failure to appear conviction rate so high? Why do people go to jail with bench warrants because they missed a court appointment because they didn't have childcare? Like, why is that the case? It's because a system is designed to create conflict between people. And so um, if you look at the crack epidemic, if you look at uh, guns in low-income neighborhoods, you, you have to know that this stuff did not originate there, especially if it wasn't originally part of our culture. It, it came from, from, from something else. So the conflict that people have and the mistrust and the lack of support, I think that it is part of um, what, what systemic racism has done and the way to combat it is for people to begin to learn each other and to try out, uh, try working with each other again. Uh, there are three C's that I've discovered. One is cultivate real relationship. Number two, connect with stakeholders. And number three is collaborate on projects. If you do that, you'll succeed no matter what. I want to just bring it like closer, right? Because we live in the same city. We are two black leaders. And if they could, they pit us against each other. But we've learned how to connect and oh, collaborate. Yeah and to get those contracts, right? So I, I look at who's successful. So we look at like a Issa Rae or we look at like a Kevin Hart and we see it's their community, right? Each person plays a role and we haven't seen a lot of success models, right? So usually the way they prop us up is one. One writer, Toni Morrison, one rapper, you know what I'm saying? But the reality is it takes a community to build a leader, right? So I'm fine coming in as a subcontractor under Black Wall Street. I'm fine serving under Dr. Hackett and doing my work because I won't let them pick me against him and he won't let them put, pit me against him and we're able to work together so i really think it starts with understanding what real black success looks like and i wouldn't be anywhere without my community and i'm sure you wouldn't be anywhere without yours but we often don't talk about that on the facebook lives right we don't talk about that part i think that's so important that you just mentioned it because like, it's okay to you know not have to be the face or the front, forefront of every movement, stand behind somebody who's doing something positive in the community and, and rather behind them and give them the support that they need instead of always having, like you said, like we have a mentality at times like it's one at a time, like it's like one major entertainer or athlete or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Plenty of, there's plenty of money, plenty of everything out here, plenty of resources for us all to thrive and it's okay to stand behind somebody and, and support them as well. Yeah. Um, I was doing some research on, on a website, neilberg.com, and said 81% of um, 
the, in the community in Asheville is white. Ten percent black, one percent Asian. Is it hard to build a, a black wall street in a community that's predominantly white? It is. It is not. It is not. Um, and that's because Black Wall Street is not about black business. Mm -hmm. Black Wall Street, historically, is I have a product that the greater community needs, and I'm charging them a fair, a fair price for that. Mm -hmm. And when the money comes in, we're able to, to, to utilize it and do multiple things in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a report, um, the AEO Tapestry Report, and it, it, it reported on the impact of COVID on black businesses. Um, AEO, the company, the American Enterprise Opportunity. So it's a national report. Actually, I think uh, Capital One Bank created a grant based on this specific report in partnership with that agency. And they said that the number one, not the number one, one of the reasons that black businesses fail is because they serve a customer with limited spending power, which means that black businesses are, are serving things to other people that are probably black and don't have very much money. So the average median income in our area for black people is 29,000, for white people is 69,000. Huge income gaps. Even 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 in our coffee shop, the the average cup of coffee is somewhere between $3 and 3.50 with all the extra other stuff is $5. And so it might be that uh, a low income earning black person cannot afford that. Uh, but this is a black owned business that serves everybody. And so part of what we do with Black Wall Street is show people how to repackage their goods and services so they can serve the greater community. Money is green. And if you're going to compete, you're not going to compete effectively simply by only serving black people. You are who you are. We are who we are. But we have to package our stuff so we serve the world. And look at that system, right? 10% of Asheville is black. So that's Asheville. What about the surrounding counties, right? Mm -hmm. Where they are much more rural, right? So we are not just attracting business owners from Asheville. We are the Western North Carolina uh, Black Wall Street. Do we even have another one in the West? No. Right? And so when we think about, that's a 16 county radius. So now we're looking at an even bigger population, and one of the ways they keep us separated is by zip codes and area codes. And we know how that has failed, fared for our people, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the continuation of competitiveness by area code. You get your set, you get your hood, right? Mm -hmm. It's really unfortunate. Should we be intentional when it comes to, not saying we should you know, support other businesses, other um, races, but should we, be intentional about you know, supporting black-owned businesses as well. Absolutely, absolutely. When, when, you, when you think about um, a community or an economy, um, you think about the dollar that you're about to spend, that dollar can do a number of different things. Uh, that dollar can go to support the large franchise or it can go to support the local business. Mm -hmm. If it supports the local business, then you begin to, that dollar becomes a weapon against poverty in the community. And um, our state, the state of North Carolina, has what's called the Healthy NC 2030 plan. And they list the 17 social determinants of health. The number one social determinant of health is poverty. It, it is indicating that poverty is the root cause of health disparity. You get what I'm saying? So just imagine that dollar. It might be used to, to go to a, a franchise coffee shop. That's fine. Or it can go to support a locally owned coffee shop. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it goes to support that locally owned coffee shop, that thing has an exponential in, in impact. It's actually changing the community. So when you look at the dollar that you're spending, especially when you decide to spend it with black, with black owned businesses, you're helping end poverty in your own city mm -hmm. just by your spending power. I want to say, I kind of push back a little bit because I believe I'm going to be intentional about every dollar I spend. And I think one of the ways that the black community has been robbed is going to corner stores that don't reinvest in the community, right? So be careful about where you put your dollar, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, if you come to Black Wall Street, I can guarantee you the dollar that you're putting in is gonna go somewhere. But if you go to the wrong 
local shop is going into somebody else's community. So you really want to be intentional about where you spend your money in general. And if you are spending your money with that um, chain coffee shop, it's great. Where the where are the grants coming from? Where are you buying new uniforms for the football team? Like, what is your investment back in our community? And I don't care if you black, brown, purple, or green. If I'm investing my money with you, you owe my community. Absolutely. I think about the, the book, um, the autobiography of Malcolm X, and he, he, he mentioned it in the book where he was saying, you know, other races will set up stores in our community. You think about it, they'll set up a little store in our communities. People that are running, they don't look like us, and what they'll do is they'll set up shop in our communities, make their money, and then leave and go back to wherever they live. Mm-hmm. They go back to their home and with our money. And the next day, they, you know, they come back the next day, set up shop again, open up the stores, mm-hmm. and you know, they come there and it's like intentional. And when you think about it, when you see little stores, most of the time they're in our community. Yeah, they are. It's, it's not in their community. They would never open it in their community. Mm-hmm. They get mad if you open the wrong kind of school. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 Absolutely. So it's like those like those type of things like that. It's like some of those being intentional, but it's like that type of business kind of tears down our community because you know, you know the impact. You know. And it's not just the liquor stores. They bring their nail shops. They yeah, like come on, like let's yeah. talk about it, right? Mm-hmm. Like. Yep. It's a lot of different businesses that we go to that we say are local small business owners, but we do not tax them for their participation in our economy. Absolutely. How should, how can business, uh, black-owned business, because I, I, I had this conversation with Jim that I had on um, last year in Utah. He, he built a, a, a $40 billion hedge for him and some of his business partners. And I, and I spoke to him about some of these, you know, some of the um, black entrepreneurs that I interviewed were saying, you know, a lot of time they were trying to get access to capital and they were trying to get a purchase. We had a couple ladies trying to buy a gas station. One other young lady, um, she tried to purchase um, property for a piece of cobble fat. And what she would do is she tried not to tell them that she was black because you know they didn't have. And for her, she said she had everything. The credit was great. She had money for it and everything like that. But once they found out that she was black, then she never heard from the people again. But and in other situations where they need that type of funding to get these businesses, you can't get. How can can black-owned businesses um, get the type of access to that, to that capital? It, it, it does require, um, it does require um, some, some savvy uh, <coughs> business acumen. We had a conversation with um, one of our white ally partners yesterday, and, and, um, and they asked what could they do. And we explained um, a principle of the Underground Railroad that the white people that participated would would figure out how to coordinate with other white people to help black people be free um and so in some situations it requires that that you partner with an ally that will go in for you if the system is jacked up um and the system is not letting you in through a door then you need to go through the roof like you you got to tear the roof you got to figure out how to get in uh because once you get in you can change it now this is not fair it's not fair that, that we have to do things like this, right. um, but it is part of, of the way that change happens. It doesn't happen in a vacuum, it happens with, with, with community. And so for those people that do not, that have not gotten funded, uh, that's a common story uh, that people are not funded because they're, they're black. And companies come up with all types of reasons why, and it's really because they're black. Right. And so you might need to partner. And, and Mr. Hutchinson, when I and when I talked to him about it, I was telling him, you know, they were hesitant. And, and he, he said, you know, if he's looking at looking at a business to to partner with or, or, or help fund, he's not looking at your know, skin color. He's looking at uh, is it going to make money and help him, you know, make money and profit off of it. Well, which sounds great, but in reality, you know, a lot of times the people. They look at us a lot of times. They don't want to work with us just because of like, it. They use any type of excuse. And it's hard to just pull the race card and say, this is the reason why I cut them black. But like he was saying, like, he's looking at it from the standpoint of it's something that, that makes sense, makes money, and they invest in it. But a lot of times, even if it does, like the young lady with the peach coffee factory, they find out she's black. They didn't want to. 
I mean, we got to be honest, right? So even those of us who get funded are grossly underfunded. So that's like number one. And number two, mm -hmm. most of us um, who are looking for loans probably don't need loans. We probably need more sales and more traction in our business. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had a lot of financial acumen, a lot of, and, and I'm just telling you, I've been to a billion business classes about money and I didn't learn anything about money so I had a little bit and lost a little bit and gained a little bit and lost it again, mm -hmm. right? So you have to go through that kind of process. I think that's really important. Also, I think it's really, really important to build good relationships. Do you have a banker, right? The first time I walked in the door with a $50,000 check and they was like, we gonna have to hold it for 21 days but my banker bay was like hey Aisha I got you right because so I do something I go to the same bank every week I deposit I build relationship I wink my eye take you a Christmas card because that teller has the power to do things based on who they are that we don't even know about do you know when you take your check in if they decide to hold it is strictly on your relationship with the teller I'm honestly, telling you and to me honestly <laughs> I go I always get direct deposit, so I really don't always go in the bank unless it's something that I really need or whatever. But for the most part, um, everything I do is just pretty much, you know, direct deposit, deposit or, mm -hmm. or just uh, a transaction that I can. Um, like I did a transaction last year for some money, and they just I just made a call to, um, to the credit union, and they they didn't even look. I didn't. I mean, I didn't have to do anything. Just of you course, know, they checked my credit, make sure everything was good, and then boom, I was just. I didn't even have to go in. The first time I bought a car and I was like, hey, are you going to run my credit? She was like, ma'am, you have the money in the bank. You can just have the car. Like, that blew my mind. Yeah. It blew my mind. Like, they didn't have to run my credit. There are a lot of hoops that we jump through as black and brown people because we don't understand the system. We, we and then we, we don't know how to question the system. We don't know what the next word to say right. um, to yeah. move on to or, the next or level. How to, how to navigate the relationships to learn the system. Yeah. We're so mad at it that we don't have the conversation. Uh, with the people that know it or read about it to understand it. I, had a, I bought a school. When I purchased a school, I was like, uh, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm, I'm going to get a loan to buy this school, and I, I don't use credit. And my banker said, Well, we don't need credit. We don't need to check your credit. It's a business loan. I said, Huh? I, I didn't. I didn't know. But now I do. <laughs> I, know, I was sitting there like, Oh, they're going to run my credit. <laughs> you know. What a would having more black-owned banks kind of help, you know, solve it some of these issues? It, it I, should. I think in our area, I don't even really know why. I think it's, I think it's one in, in Columbia, South Carolina, which is about an hour and 20 minutes or so from us, but I don't really know a lot of like black-owned mm -hmm. banks that, you know, in our area, or period, really. A lot of, um, yeah. What is want, you know they said that's why Killer Mike got arrested because he trying to get break into banking when he won his Grammys. So we have to really consider like the thing we got to think about when we trying to get contracts like this. The young lady with the peach cobbler factory, she wanted land. She wanted land. Like y'all got to remember that. Like land in this country, there are deeds that are at the register of deeds that say no black people should inherit this land, right? So we have to think about what is it we're even asking for. And a lot of times when we're doing this business, we don't really understand the type of assets that we're trying. We're just like, oh, I just want to make peach cobbler. No, you asking for a factory. You're asking for land. And if we give you as a black woman land, we are turning the tides on something that we designed, right? And, and that was weird because she said everything changed. Out for her. she was one of the people that, that had the credit, the money, and everything. She just wanted that, like you said, that land just to. Yeah. And once they found out who she was, and she was a black woman, it was like, I mean, thank you. She, now, she has two of them down in Atlanta, so she, she found another property that she could use, but that, I guess that one particular person mm -hmm. was on to her. Yeah. And they put it, they put it in their deed. Like, they don't just put it. You know, there was a Habitat for Humanity. They were getting ready to build a house for a family, and they had to go to the court because it was on the deed that no black family should inherit that land. Oh, that's crazy. And that was in the last three years. So I'm not talking about something that happened 20 years ago. I'm talking about today. Yeah, like this is something we have to watch out for. So understanding our history so that we're not doomed to repeat it. Do you think we understand the true value of our dollar? Um, because like you said, a lot of times we, like, we stay by the trillion dollars and uh, buying power. Do you think our people understand the true dollar value of black dollars? I don't think people do. Um, and I'm still learning the value of a dollar and I, I work in money. Um, but I, I don't think that people understand the value of it because we're trained to be consumers. 
Um, and as a consumer, we're so concerned about immediate gratification and what can happen right now. Uh, not really thinking about what could happen if you just plan a little further. My, my wife, um, her, her mother and father, I think this year they've been married 50 years. Uh, there are seven children. And she told me that her dad never made more than $28,000 a year. Mama didn't work. None of the kids work. And he bought a car for each one of the siblings when they turned 16. How in the world did daddy do that? You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at how he lived life, you look at what he bought, what, what, what he allowed to influence him. He wasn't influenced by fad or by design or by popularity. He understood his priorities. And so the value of his dollar was not only about how he made money, but it was also about what he spent money on. And our people are convinced to spend money. In fact, during the 2008 recession, our people were so important that the government gave $600 as a stimulus check to stimulate the whole economy. But the money didn't go to everybody. The money only went to people who lived in poverty. That tells you that the whole country is propped up by the spending habits of people who live in poverty. It made me think about that back with the pandemic when those stimulus checks were coming out. I never get back at home when people were getting some people were getting upset when the checks didn't arrive all the time and then when they finally got up, I never forget it was there were lines of people just standing outside of like a uh, like a crab shack. And people were just out there standing in line. Yeah, and balling out of like, control. Crazy, exactly. It was like this money this money just gonna call yeah, they didn't know that they were feeding the beast. Exactly. They're upgrading cell phones. Because if they would have held them checks for about six weeks, we could have got another check. And another check. Or put them checks together, we could have bought a property. Like, there are so many things that could have been done. What, what do you say are is the big, biggest misperception about that? You know, speaking about how we misuse those things around that time. Like, what do you say is like something like the biggest misperception? So for me, it's like this. People are so concerned about having money, but money, you have to make it, you have to save it, and you have to grow it. And if you don't have all three of those, then you will never reach what you're looking for. So I can make money all day, but if I'm going to spend it on Gucci and Louis Vuitton and trips and Crab Shack, I'm not going to be able to save it. Right. And even though I'm good at saving money, if I don't learn how to invest it, you know, I was sitting up with $20,000 in my bank account and I had no 401k because I was severely overbanked and not a single banker said, hey, let's move some of this so that you have a retirement. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you have to know how to make it, save it, and grow it. I think money is a tool, um, and I use money as a tool. I use money to purchase time. I know that I'm not going to have any more time on the earth than whatever time I'm allotted. Like I, My money I won't be able to give me more years. But what it can do, it can make my current years better years. Um, I can always make more money. So I use my money to buy time. Um, I hire a lot of people, I contract with a lot of people so that I can do what I want to do when I want to do it. Um, and, uh, and when I think about the money that comes in, um, it is, it, it's just the beginning. For me, it's never the ending. So if I bring, if I bring in one dollar, I'm not thinking about how that dollar can feed me now. I'm thinking about what I can do with that dollar to feed my family for the next day, next week, next month, next year. Um, Mr. Hank, I know you were um, big on uh, giving second chances to read uh, into six. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the importance of that and just like, why is that so important? Yeah, it was important for me because I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was indicted in 2012 for um, health care fraud. Um, and the crazy thing about it is everybody, including the judge, knows that I didn't do it. In fact, the judge, if anybody were to read the transcript, he says, I know you didn't do this. Um, he spoke so highly of me that, that I thought he was about to drop the charges. He's, and then he said, uh, but according to the statute, one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D, uh, the code of whatever, um, we have to sentence you to four years in prison 
three years probation and a $1.5 million fine. And um, that was because at age 26, I built a company and I was good at the work, but I didn't know business. I didn't, I didn't have the right supervisors in place. I didn't have the right checks and balances. And one person in my company filed fraudulent paperwork. And because I didn't know the law, me paying him meant that I was part of the conspiracy. It was just a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. So there I was in prison. And I'm not like, I heard that criminals know that they're going to go to prison one day. And so they prepare for it financially and mentally and stuff. I'm not prepared for none of that. Everybody in prison knew that I didn't belong there. You get what I'm saying? Um, but when I got there, everything changed for me in a positive way. The first thing I, I did was to understand the importance of leadership. My life is my fault. And while I look at it and say that I went to prison for what somebody else did, I actually learned that it was what I did. Because something told me I should not have hired him. But I ignored that little voice inside. So I had to deal with that, that I knew better that I need to be a better leader. And then while I was in prison, I was like, you know, I don't want to go crazy while I'm in here. I got to do something. So they hired me to teach the GED program. Mm. And whatever I do, like I should say, I'm going to excel at it. So, so many people got their GED as a result of me being, me being a teacher there that the wardens from my prison and other prisons would come and monitor my classroom because they wondered, what is he doing? And I would teach math based on drug economies. Like we, we would teach social studies and history uh, based on current events and understanding laws um, and, 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 and what was going on as noted on the news and newspaper, etc. Um, and I was the town driver, which meant that they gave me the keys to a car and every day I would leave prison and I would go and drive, taking people back and forth to the, to the, um, the airports and bus stations, picking people up, etc. And so it was still prison, it was federal prison and I hated it, but I learned so much. When I got out of prison, I realized that they were not trying to train people in prison to start over. The only things that they were offering was GED and lawn care. And so a person like me that had degrees and was executive, there was no training. There was no opportunity for school or distance learning. And so I created it. And so I got out of prison and I started to create what was needed for returning citizens. One of the first things I created was a reentry program. Uh, the other thing I created with the Workforce Development Program was, um, was employment tracks that would directly address the barriers that kept, pe kept people away from making more money. And so my, my reentry journey um, for me is like turned into a story of making lemonade out of lemons. Mm -hmm. And so I, from that standpoint, I'm grateful. I gotta say he left out something that I feel like is really critical. Before he got out, he was my supervisor. <laughs> yeah. So I was on work release. So you stay at the jail and you leave during the day and I would come to work and I was her supervisor. You know what I'm saying? So when you see somebody come from that, I remember standing outside saying, You own this whole block. He was the executive director of the nonprofit. He was the pastor at the church. They had a little parking lot they used to fight over. He was in charge of that. I said, How you come back like Ree Ross? I said, I need to know you better. I need to understand. I need to support the work that you do because this work is important. And so I've kind of watched him from like work release to the day be like the number one growing business in Asheville, start Black Wall Street. You know, his wife works at the White House. Like his kids are amazing, right? So to just watch somebody come back from so such a horrific, place is really beautiful and um, I, I hope this whole community is behind him like I am. It's, it's very impactful because a lot of times you know, a lot of guys you know, when you get, get out of prison it's like they, they have a hard time getting a job and it's like what have you turned to me sometimes they've been in there for so long that it's like all the notes mm -hmm. yeah. and they end up you know traveling. they end up doing something and they do they, they do. It's, it's because they never redefined who they are. They, that, that's because what happened. They, they took on um, what, what, what I call a lie identity. The lie identity is what people say about you that's a lie because they don't know who you really are. And you believe. And you believe it. And then uh, those people that, that go against it, they construct a my identity, which is just what I want to be, but it's still in reaction to what you said. I'm not a such and such, I'm blah, 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 blah. But you're still reacting to what people said. 
versus an identity where you stand in the mirror and say, who am I? Without any of the extra, you take away everything. Who am I? Um, and when I, when I was in prison, they took away all the extra and I was able to really tap into who I am. Um, and I am not just this or that. I am number one, I'm Jay Hackett. Um, I am an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm Jay Hackett. I am an entrepreneur and I, I can do anything. Welcome back to the Cross Live Podcast. We had to take a, a quick break for just one second. Um, one of the things I want to ask you about, you talk about helping so many people right now with your businesses. Do you feel like every business should have like a philanthropic arm or some type of nonprofit attached to it to where you are helping? I think they're doing it anyway. <laughs> I think uh, most entrepreneurs are, are doing their, their their business to make money. And part of their budget is being spent on community activities. They're throwing block parties and back to school drives and they're handing out turkeys and Christmas gifts and they're mentoring people and training people. And they don't even know that these are grant fundable activities. Um, and when folks do things, they make donations. Um, I believe that every nonprofit uh, should follow the pattern of larger, I mean that every business should follow the pattern of larger businesses um, and have a nonprofit partner or a nonprofit arm. Um, what I do is consider social entrepreneurship. And social entrepreneurship has a triple bottom line, people, place, and profit. One does not sacrifice the other. Take care of people, honor your place, and make as much money as you honestly can. Um, I So under working with Jay Hackett, I've realized that it's important for me to make sure that everything on my calendar has a funding source. Um, that's the way that I stay in the profit, right? So I stay profitable by making sure that every engagement I have has a funding source. And yeah, like Jay said, I was doing things like my Entrepreneur Accelerator, which is a boot camp for business owners. People call me constantly asking for coaching or advice about their business. And I was doing it out of the kindness of my heart instead of actually collaborating and helping make outcomes for organizations who need them. So aligning my values with the values of good, strong collaborators, partners, and funders is a part of what I need to do as an entrepreneur to be successful. Um, I don't think you can have one without the other. That's why I think a lot of our businesses get a bad reputation because we're so burnt out because we don't have the right funding sources in place. Mm -hmm. when, when you speak about those business, getting those business grants, what is the key to finding like, like those, like those business grants that you need to help fund? Oh, well, I'll tell you the key. I created a technology. <laughs> I have a software called Grant Suite. It is the number one best software on the planet, okay. and it searches the right grants for you. I'm super proud because uh, our patent and trademark uh, was approved, and so I'm super duper excited about that uh, just to be in the technology world. Um, but if a person did not have my software and they just wanted to do it on their own, uh, when you find a business grant, uh, you want to do three things. Talk about the, 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 the owner and the founder. Uh, they, they're going to want to know what your journey was. Why are you doing what you're doing? And it can't just be to make money. Uh, the second thing that they want to know is what you do for the community. Um, how is the thing that you're doing making it different? Are you a barber, a salon owner, and you also provide support services or counseling? Um, are you in an area that was gentrified and your business is helping turn the tide? Uh, do you train people and so your business also provides a, a training platform? And then the third thing, which most people don't know about, connect your business to the city's strategic plan. When you connect your business to your city's strategic plan, supporting your business does not only mean supporting your business, but supporting your business means I'm supporting the whole city. And so now you've attached your business to a problem and a solution that the city has already identified. That's, that's great information. You know, I, I, I've only received one business grant. You know. I, I didn't really know what I was doing, but what to do, how to get it. Um, I'll never forget this one. We went and did an interview with Ms. Valerie Bridges, who owns Bridges Consulting, uh, a technology firm down in uh, College Park, in Georgia. And uh, you, know, you know what you're doing, so you should just check out this uh, business grant that Facebook is doing. So they gave me the information, they filled out the application, they gave me like a $2,500 uh, uh, grant for, mm -hmm. my, for my business. But I didn't really know, but it's like those grants are really out there, just a lot of time. We don't know about it. We don't know how to get get to it. So oh yeah. Oh yeah. Information is super powerful. 
So, yeah. And, and just to go back and plug in your uh, your your uh, your business as well, your grant suite. Grant suite. And that, is that for anybody or just this area? Or oh, anybody. As a matter of fact, uh, we have customers all over the world. Make sure I type it. Yeah. yeah. Grantsuite.com. So that's, see, that's the type of information that we need to know because, a lot of, like I said, we don't know how to get that type of access to capital or those type of grants to continue to help fund our business. And a lot of times, I remember mean, even talking about the Keith Harbor, we, a black owned business, we make enough just for us to help ourselves. And that's, that's it. We don't have enough to sustain or you know, to help mm-hmm. take care of all the people. Right, 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 right. To have these types of things in place, like grants and these uh, non profit organizations, Mm -hmm. our business, as well as other people, those are super important to have. One of the things that really has been so eye opening for me is when you get that 501c3, of course, it opens you up for grants, but it also opens you up for fundraising. And I think a missed opportunity is that as black-owned businesses, we don't do a lot of fundraising. We are so like, can I get a loan? Can I get a grant? And we are so stuck in systems instead of going out and doing it our own way, right? So once you get that 501c3, you are actually have a license to raise money. I know being an actual, this is what, the $3 billion uh, uh, tourist, mm-hmm. tourist um, town. What, 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 what do you anticipate some of the uh, going for some of the things, uh, whether it's challenges or anything other uh, that you anticipate from the travel industry? So much, so much money coming to this to Asheville. The, the some of the, the the challenges and gaps um, that we see are exactly what we prepare for, and that is uh, a knowledge gap. Um, we know that uh, there are lists of things people don't know. They don't know that the money exists. They don't know where the money is at. They don't know how to get the money. And, and we know where it is, we know how to get it, um, and we, of course we know that it exists. And this is just part of the system. Um, and so what we do with Black Wall Street is the same thing that I was doing selling Little Debbie, ta- little Debbie Cakes. I went to one part of the town and found out uh, the shortcut, and then I came back and told our people. And I think if we all can do that, then it'll make, it'll make it a better world for everybody. I think we also have to challenge our TDA to show us the money, show us the numbers. How many black-owned businesses are you supporting? If you did 100 national campaigns, how many were with women? How many were with black-owned businesses? How many were with Latin-owned businesses? So actually, you know, holding our officials accountable to making sure that we get accurate picture of what's happening so that we can hold other people accountable is really important too. Speaking of Black Wall Street, do you think that term, or just putting black in front of do you, do you ever think that puts other people off because you say, why does that, you know, of course, you know, some people say, why does everything have to be about race or mm-hmm. black attack to it? Do you think that term or, or Black Wall Street kind of puts off communities or, or people? It, it does, people? and I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you sell to everybody, then you're not really selling to anybody. Yeah. Exactly. We, we have a responsibility to our people. Um, and again, it's not exclusive. Black business is everybody's business. Mm-hmm. And in, in our organization, we have over 250 volunteers, most of which are white. We have about 53 sponsors, all of which are owned by white people, companies owned by white people. Mm-hmm. Um, the GATE program itself has 38 champions, uh, people in the tourism industry uh, that are owners and, and business owners and leaders and community leaders, 38 Uh, that said that they would champion this project. Um, And almost all of them are white. All of our funding sources are white. Um, And so we're not doing this work by ourselves. And if truth be told, there's a lot of other cultures, including white people, around around the country that are interested in making things better. And by making things better, it's not making things black. It's by saying that you wanna be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Bad things happen when good people do nothing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, that's true. I want to play devil guy Evans just for one quick second because I know that some people, like I said, be like, well, why does everything have to be about race or why does it have to be called black mm-hmm. Wall Street? If someone came to you and they were like, well, if we had a, a white Wall Street or something like that, 
what would you say to yourself right there? Because you know somebody out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say you already have a white Wall Street. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> See that today? Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. wanna do you wanna go go there and, and eat? Like we can go yeah. together, friend. Let, let, let's go. And the reason I can afford to go eat there is because I own my business. Like there, there has to be a, a pragmatic, practical bottom line. The bottom line here is that we know that disparities exist. We know that black people built this country. We know that, that the country did not pay for the buildings or the work or the labor. Like we know that. What are we doing about it now? We're not trying to go back and rewrite history, but we are trying to write a new future. And we're being very intentional about it. It's not exclusive. It's very inclusive. We're saying let's work together and let's work together knowing that what we're doing is going to help black people. Yeah. We got a couple more things. I know we got to get out of here. Um, couple, last week I went to a uh, I went to a comedy show up in Charlotte. I had a friend who uh, he's a comedian. He's on right now. He's on tour with Tony Rock. Mm -hmm. And when Tony Rock went on stage, you know, one part of his set he started you know, talk, talking about race jokes. And one of the lady, she was a was a white lady. She was upset. He said, well, my best friend is black. When he started, crack, he started cracking more jokes. On and um, eventually, you know, she, she had a couple of drinks and then she made her way to the stage and she actually got up there on stage with him. And he was like, you know, he, he was still joking with said, This lady comes up and I had the right to defend myself. So once she finally got up and she had her arms up like this, like she was ready to. <laughs> but he stepped away from it and then security finally. But it's finally. Finally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the same, it's the same thing. Uh -huh. We always say, like, like, why? How did she even get that uh -huh. close to the stage? Uh -huh, uh -huh. But it's like, for some reason, you know, when you, when you talk about race, it's still something that, that triggers a lot of people. Why do you think that is still uh, such a sensitive topic? Why they, uh, people are afraid to you know, discuss race and help us solve that solution? So um, in my thought leadership as a diversity, equity, and inclusion expert, really talk about the difference between an activist and an advocate, right? And what we have is a lot of people that want to activate. So when we see there's an issue, we all want to go to Starbucks and wear our Black Lives Matter t-shirts and black out our Facebook posts, but that's not going to change the policy practices and procedures. And so we really need to learn to advocate, right? So getting up at the Tony Rock comedy show will not create systemic change, but going to your boss and asking why you and your best friend don't make the same amount of money is the conversation that we need to be having. And so I think a lot of it is not really understanding. I mean, Jay taught at the Institute and we would go around and ask people like, what do they think their job was? And they didn't understand that, yes, I run this facility and my job is to make sure that this inclusive for everybody. It's hard for them to see their work outside of that activism, that in your face, that yelling, because it's an emotional response. It's a trauma response. Fragility, white fragility is a trauma response. Do you, do you think people got too comfortable with, like you said, like, like just the activism or just like the symbolism of like what Black Lives Matter, instead of like helping like push policy to get done, yeah. to help, help improve our community? Do you think? You got so caught up in those type of movements instead of like helping you like push those type of policies. Yeah. To kind of like, you know, yeah, like absolutely. Policies. As long as there's an object, an external object to point to, you never have to think about yourself. Mm -hmm. As long as there's something going on on TV, you never have to answer for the board meeting that you were in. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and and the and as Aisha described, this trauma response is because you're hurting too. You're hurting as well. And okay, I blacked out my Facebook. I got a hundred likes. So now I have a hundred little dopamine spikes that said, good little girl, good little girl, good little girl, right? But when I go to my boss, Jim, and say my best friend is black and I have to always buy the mimosas at lunch, I'm asking Jim to do something. And that's a problem because I'm actually trying to inspire change. Yeah. And the reason that a person says, ouch, is because they know something is there. Yep. That that's a sensitivity, mm -hmm. and it's a good thing. I would be much more concerned if if if, if people said nothing. Yeah. I, I I just think, like I said, we need our counterparts to you know, help pitch in. And I, I I remember hearing things people saying things like, when we had a black president, we're showing progress, but yeah, that's not enough. Don't think just because we have a black president that. It's all, all, all. The presidency is not a person. Presidency is an institution. And my wife, uh, Dr. Lacia Black Hackett, the first ever in the United States Chief Diversity Officer for the U.S. Department of Labor. And uh, 
And what she explained to me was that politics and government is two totally different things. Um, and whoever's in office is in office as a spokesperson. Like they are the leader of the country, but that person might change. But what lasts are the policies, the procedures and the practice. And so as the nation's leading DEI expert, she, um, she explained just like what Aisha said, it has to be more than just race. And so when you write policy that are, that's really about fairness, you have a different conversation, a more in-depth conversation, and you no longer have the external target. They just saying that because they black. No, it's also true when you're a woman. It's also true if you're part of LGBTQIA+. Uh, it's also true when you get around in a wheelchair. It's also true when you don't speak English as a first language. It's also true. You get what I'm saying? Yep. Mm -hmm. And like I say, I, I just feel like that's a, a big issue. Like, and I feel like we need the, the counterpart to help pitch in and help solve these. But it's like, even I never get back when I, was, when I had my job. I would not think it's like um, some of my uh, co like, well, we don't we don't need equality. And it, to me, it's so ironic that the people that say that we don't need equality don't want It's like, you, you, you'll say it because the system benefits. But the system's not benefiting them. Let's be clear. Think. The system is not benefiting anybody. 12 out of 12 people stressed out at work. 12 out of 12 people mm -hmm. ain't got no money. 12 out, like the, the reality is no, it is just a psychological mind game, mm -hmm. right? Because guess what? If you are a white man and you have a wife and your wife makes 60 cents on the dollar, you gotta work harder. Mm -hmm. Then your daughter gonna make 60% less. That's, that's tapping into your pockets. But I think what, when I look at it, it's like, you look at a majority of businesses, like the, the people who are at the top, like the CEOs and the managers, they, they don't look like us. Mm -hmm. like there are some things where you will see people like that, but for the most part, our counterparts don't look like us that are running these, these top companies or and they, they're the one who help them. Well, they the one percent though the other 99 percent of people look like them suffering and that's what we have to remember and that's our great unifier mm -hmm. but and another thing is so and i always tell people i'm not going to say that my i don't i've never used my skin color as, a, as an excuse to say hey, i didn't receive this opportunity but at the same time i'm not going to say that it doesn't play a part in it as well so a lot of times when we have management that are white, a lot of times, it, it come, to me it feels like it's a, like a relatability factor. It's like, I'm gonna put somebody in a position that makes me feel comfortable or, or that I can relate to more, even so I, when I cover sports outside of, um, outside of the pocket, I cover sports. And just like in the NFL, they had to implement women groups. So we're making NFL teams have to implement at least one black head candidate for a head coach. And you didn't feel like, that was an issue. Why would you have to implement that type of rule? Oh, of course they, they, they knew it was an issue. And they had to implement the rule. Um, and the reason they had to do it is because uh, they needed an object. Mm -hmm. they, they needed an object. They needed something to say, look, we did this. And so now it's better. And what I'm saying is doing that don't make it better. Doing, doing that does not make it better. Just having like that symbolism. Even, I'll never forget, even on the football fields, in the, toward, in the back of the end zone, they would have like Black Lives Matter painted on the back of the end zone. Like, okay, that's, that's great, but what is that helping to solve? It's mm -hmm. just like that, that symbolism or having that figure, like you said, in place, but it's not really. Like, uh, Absolutely. So there's this thing I call the Moses and Pharaoh syndrome. And, I, and I, uh, there are people that don't like it in practice. It sounds good but they don't like it in practice you have to go to Pharaoh and say Pharaoh let my people go but then you also have to have an entirely different conversation with your own people you, decide, you gotta say look y'all we gotta get ready to go we have to get ready like we're getting ready to go and build our own community we're getting ready to go and, and establish wealth like we're getting ready to go and we're gonna have to manage the promised land. We're gonna to have to deal with our own cycles. We're gonna to have to deal with our own stuff. We're gonna to have to train. We're gonna to have to use those same talents that you use to build Egypt. You're gonna to have to do it without Egypt's crutch now. You get what I'm saying? And, and there are a lot of people that, 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 that crack under that type of pressure uh, because they prefer slavery. Um, and, and, and we just have to be honest. Now that is a behind the door with the family conversation. 
But it is a conversation that needs to be had. Mm -hmm. At some point, you got to stop wasting money, wasting time, wasting your energy. And if you're going to get the business, get 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 down to business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you need a certification to do what you want to do, go get the certification and stop wasting time with your friends. If you if the people around you are overly comfortable with where you are, they're not going to be excited with where you're going anyway. So what do you want? To stay where you are or to go somewhere else? Like there has to be a moment where we say to our people, y'all, y'all know we got to compete. Y'all know they don't like us. Y'all know they're not going to give it to us easy. So what are we going to do to be excellent? Absolutely. Dr. Lakeisha Hallman, I'm not sure you guys are aware of. She's she owns the village market you know, down in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. It's basically kind of like the same concept of you know, um, a black wall street where she had black owned vendors come in to the store and they had their business. They, they have all their products set up in the store. I, I never forget when I sat with her. She, she told us, this is 2019, right before the pandemic, she said, having a seat um, in the, at a table that's a press is still in um, you know, a press system. So it's like, man, going to these places where people that are um, giving us just enough, it's like still a press that's like holding us back, and it's, it's not enough. So said, imagine, you know, pulling your resources away from that table and say, I'm going to go build my own table. So, you know, mm -hmm. something that I'm going to do more of. Have to sit at the table and the persistence that I perceive. And um, I'm saying, just, just the mindset. I think we've just been so conditioned for so long to do the same thing over and over. And then, like I can say, kind of going back to like, you see like these major corporations, you see these as important figures in these oppositions. You see that, so we're just kind of like, we're not comfortable with doing business with our own people and being a supporter and all have like, like, some people in that type of position, which is all about going back to that. You're going to think this is funny, but that's why I, I always tune in to Tyler Perry. I always tune in to Tyler Perry because the president going to be black. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing about always, you know what I'm saying? Yep. The lawyer going to be black. You know, mm -hmm. I, was in, I was watching the scene and it was like, the black president, the black <laughs> head of the FBI, yep. and the criminal was the white man. I said, now look at him. Yep. And, and people say what they want to say about me, talk about the wigs and everything they have on the show, but representation matters. So when you, when you see that type of stuff, it makes you feel like they look like me. I can make sure that representation is so, so important in that you know, position. But like I said, we just have to you know, shift the mindset and, um, and support our own people instead of like, you know, like I said, just tearing each other down. Now, my, uh, my last two questions, we have the grind face coming up. Inmate. Oh yeah! Can you, can you talk about the, the grind fest? Yes. All is to come from with the grind fest. Grind fest. No, first it is not the grind fest. It's just grind, grind fest. fest. Grind fest. All right, but grind fest. Grind fest is the celebration of Black business and entrepreneurship. Uh, it is three days of good old fashioned fun. Uh, so all of the vendors are are black owned. Uh, they're black owned businesses and and. Um, and products and services, etc. Um, and our white ally companies are there as sponsors and supporters. Uh, we have an opportunity tent where people are offering uh, things that benefit uh, black and brown communities. Uh, this weekend is going to be like none other. We're going to have a casino night just like Harlem nights. Now, oh, now you want to shoot me in the pinky toe. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> like it's going, we're going to dress up. We're going, we're, going, we're going to do it big on the red carpet. Have a nice casino night. And then on Saturday, we got carnival rides, um, food trucks, vendors, services. We got laser tag, axe throwing, bouncy houses. I mean, it's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be amazing. Bring the kids, come and enjoy. We got stilt walkers, performers, bands, uh, DJs. And then on Saturday night, we got a concert at the Salvage Station. Uh, last year, we had Waka Flocka and Big Boy. Uh, we haven't released the artist for this year yet, but make sure you uh, go to grindfestavl.com and uh, go ahead and register. It's a free conference. I mean, it's a free event. Uh, so you come and enjoy it. And then on Sunday, we do it all over again with uh, music from the diaspora. So we got reggaeton. Uh, we got, um, uh, uh, Lord, uh, Latinx music. We got Afrobeat music, bands. And then on Sunday night, we got a gospel showcase. It's going to be ridiculous. Great turnout, um, a lot of fun, man. We might have to come back up here and come to. Oh, you definitely, definitely should. You we definitely should. Like a, just over an hour away from me, so it's not mm -hmm. far at all from home. But I, I love everything that you guys are doing. 
My last and final question before we get out here, I love to ask everybody at the end, you know, when you travel the country, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, I love to ask, what does self-investment mean to you? So I get up every day before the sun come up and I put three hours into myself. You know, I peloton, I ride my bike 15 miles, I hike, I row, I lift weights. Because at the end of the day, I know that I gotta pour into me before I can pour into somebody else. So I invest in my, my, my self-care regimen. I'm gonna leave here, I'm gonna go get my hair done. I'm gonna always just keep pouring into myself, whether it's more education, whether it's learning how to grow my money or save my money or earn my money. But I look at whatever I do for me first as an investment in self to help me kind of just get out there and do what I need to do. Um, for me, uh, this morning I woke up and I was ridiculously happy. Just, I was so happy I cried. And I went on Facebook Live and just shared that moment with, with my community. Um, because I remember, well, it was raining. It was raining and I loved the rain. But in that moment I realized I, I'm, I am at my extra house that's fully furnished and not rented. Sleeping in an extremely comfortable bed. I'm not worried about any bills. My family is comfortable. Everybody's okay. And I can go outside in the rain and just sit. And it was, it was, it, it meant nothing to anybody else, but I remember when I was incarcerated and we could never go outside in the rain. Mm -hmm. So for four years, I didn't know what rain felt like. I couldn't feel the wind or anything. But this morning I was able. So my freedom ran really, really deep. And, and I determined that, that this, is, this is what my money allows me to do, to go outside in the rain and not have to worry. Because I used to tell myself like, oh, I don't have time to work out. Like, oh, I gotta work, I gotta step, but I have the time. Absolutely, you have to, you have to make, make the time for what you, what you really wanna do. Like, so don't think about the rain, it just, it's, it's honestly a blessing. Like, I, when, when you put it in perspective, it's like, Thank God for the rain. It's still a beautiful day regardless because if you wake up to see the rain, that's already a, a blessing. Mm -hmm. Just to be able to wake up. So anything after that is just an added bonus. Yeah. To it. So just be thankful for the sunshine, thankful for the rain. Um, yeah, and I'm not even a nature person. I don't even like being outside. <laughs> but boy, when it rained, I just feel like a kid. I feel giddy. Matter of fact, when I was on Facebook Live, I said I wanted everybody to just tag me songs about rain. And they did too. They mm -hmm. like SWV Rain and yeah. Kurt Franklin Rain and <laughs> yeah. uh, Rainy Days. I mean, it was crazy, but uh, I had fun. I, I like the rain. Absolutely. Mr. Hackett and Miss Adams, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to sit down and have a conversation. I really enjoyed it. Very educational. Uh, anytime you guys need a platform, you, you know, you're always more than welcome to come back on and you know, have a conversation because these are the type of conversations that our community needs to hear as far as like pushing our culture forward, um, helping our businesses, get the funding, and support one another, and of course the education of both the dogs, is something that we need to, um, to do more of. Um, before we get out of here, can we tell everyone how to find you guys on social media? On social media, you can go to grindfestavl.com um, and just put in your, your information. You'll be able to keep in touch with us. You can also go to blackwallstreetavl.com. Do you have anything else or any advice, a word of encouragement for the people watching this interview? No, but I do want to ask you a question. I'm a journalist, okay. and I want to know what top three books you want your readers to read after this conversation. Well, got to say that, well, my number one book is going to be the book that I wrote myself, F School Life is a Black <laughs> Teacher. So definitely read that one. That will be one. But outside of my book, I would say The Magic of Thinking Big. Um, I love that book. I love Will by Will Smith. That's one of the probably one of the top five books that I've read. I just love, you know, just to see his story from his childhood to the evolution of what he became. Um, the autobiography of Malcolm X, that's another one that I would highly recommend people read because of just so many other things that he spoke about in that book. And you see, this was back in the 60s, 50s, early 1900s, some of the things that he was speaking about, and you see how much a lot of that stuff is still alive to this day, and you just see those, and you see it's like, man, he just, just to be able to foresee all of those things, like, it's amazing to, you know, and to see the transformation of what he was in the beginning to becoming Malcolm X before he went to prison, you know, studying the honorable Elijah Muhammad, 
and his teachers to see what he became, and then unfortunately his demise of you know, being killed. But just to see that evolution, that was a, that's another great book. So I would say the autobiography of Malcolm X, The Magic of Thinking Big. And your book. And my book. And Will by Will Smith. That's a, <laughs> that's a great book. What you need to tell the folks is where you get these sparkling microphones from. Well, you know what? The story behind this before we got in here. Uh-huh. I, I didn't actually buy these microphones. My brother and my friends, when they saw that I was... You uh, stole them? No. <laughs> now his community stood up for him. Yeah, they, they, they came out of sport. And so I was doing an interview. When I first started in the very beginning, I didn't have microphones, my camera, and I would just have a laptop. Not this one. But I would just sit in my dad's backyard in the store and after I graduated. And I would just always just record myself um, talking about sport. And I didn't like the way I sounded, but something told me just to keep on going. So everything that I've recorded all the way back from 2015 or 26, something like that, is still up to this day. So fast forward a little bit. Once I did, I started interviewing local entrepreneurs and then we started going to Charlotte and Atlanta. And then I said, you know what, let's, let's put together a tour. And I had never been on a plane before, so I was getting ready to fly to Jacksonville, Florida um, for the first time. I was 28, the first time I ever got on a plane. This was four years ago now. And um, I told my brother, I said, I'm thinking about getting some, some microphones just to get a little kit so I can fly on tour. He said, well, just wait until me and my wife, we're going to try to find something for you. So I don't really like to ask people for things. I like to just go get it myself. So I bought a couple of microphones and I started buying things piece by piece. So I told him about it, he said, man, I, I told you to just wait. I me and my wife, we gonna get you something. So then we were, um, randomly he texted me one day when I was recording a, uh, a talk show, you and this time we talk where we talk about solutions for our community in Union, South Carolina. And he texted me, hey, can you come out with me and the boys to uh, Buffalo Wild World? So I'm like, okay, cool. Get there, we sit down, we eat, and then one of my best friends, Marcus, he get up and go outside. And um, when he come back in, he has a big box full of like podcasts, with like the microphones, um, a, a big mixer that I don't even know how to use yet. <laughs> but um, he, they bought me a headset that come with these microphones, so they saw what I was doing and they were just willing to invest in me. So that I almost cried because it meant a lot for me to see, for them to see me and them to believe in me and my vision and just to support me. So when they bought this equipment, well, I always tell them I love them and I appreciate them because. People have to work hard for their money and they can do a lot of other things with it and they're married and they have kids. So for them to take their time and their hard earned money to invest in me, I'm um, always appreciative and thankful for them. So that's how I ended up getting the microphone. So, All right. That's a beautiful story. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you guys. Um, thank you to my friends, my brother, my best friends. Uh, thank you guys for taking the time to sit with us and share your story um, and, and just educate our people. And also, Miss Sarah Busby, she was amazing helping put this together. I know we had to kind of reschedule some things, but thank you to Sarah as well. And hopefully, everybody enjoyed this episode of the Crossing Line Podcast. Till next time, keep chasing your dreams. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Thank you.